My name is Gina Laniza. The scripture reading today is Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. It is found in your church Bibles on page 772. And for those who are able, please stand for the reading of the scriptures. Again, it is Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And it is found in your church Bibles on 772. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and, and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Gina. You know how when you get a new appliance, the first thing you do, you don't reach for the thousand page manual in 17 languages. What do you reach for? This. How do I just get this thing going, okay? One of my staffers came up to me this week and said, you know, Adam, I was sitting in the service, and the person next to me leans over and says, why are we starting over in Acts? And he said, hold on, you'll see in just a second. 20 minutes later, why are we starting over in Acts? He was like, all right, I'll tell him. Sorry about that. We spent 38 weeks in an in-depth, verse-by-verse study of the first 12 chapters of Acts, which is the first half of the book thematically, the establishment of the church. Second half is Paul's missionary journeys and missions. So we want to take this as a series and, and do it. So for four weeks, before we have our homecoming and move on to a new series, for these four weeks, we want to summarize the lessons and, 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 and give you a quick start guide to the book of Acts. Tommy Nelson, my old pastor from Texas, used to say, anybody can write a thousand pages on Romans. Who can do it in, who can grasp it concisely in 10? Who can say it in 10? That is the real genius, isn't it? To say something concisely. Uh, our student pastor, Will Rupp, uh, says it this way. He likes to say, no matter what book you study, whether it's Psalms or Isaiah or James or Acts or whatever, can you hold it in your hand? Can you say, here it is. This is Acts. And obviously, there's, that's the 30,000-foot that's the view. But can you hold it in your hand? Do you know the context of what's happening? And so that's what we're trying to do in these four weeks is that we are saying, here's Acts in your hand. Last week, let's see, we had Quick Start Guide to Acts kicked off with the gospel is for all, therefore we scatter. Remember Acts 1.8. It is for Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part. So this week... We're going to go on to round two of putting acts in your hand. So let's pray and ask for God's wisdom. So Father in heaven, as we dive into your word, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear great things. Help us not uh, just to know it deeply, but to know it broadly and to walk out of here transformed in our hearts, not just convinced in our minds and not just um, delighted or elated or changed in our emotions, but truly, Lord, down, dig down deep into our hearts and help us to see what you are trying to do in this text. May it be your voice that speaks to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, getting into the week two. If you go into a fish restaurant, and what you're really hoping for is chicken wings, you will be disappointed. I hope you are disappointed. If you go into a fish restaurant and leave saying, man, that was just like chicken wings, something is very wrong. Because fish should taste like fish. It's the same disappointment that we have in marriage when we put expectations on it that are not meant, that it wasn't meant to bear. 
It's not that marriage is broken. A lot of people think marriage is broken. It's just as an institution, it, it can't work. It's not that marriage is broken. It's that we are broken, right? And so it just exposes our brokenness. When guys especially get married, they have this idea that marriage is going to be like all sex and selfies, and it turns out that it's uh, actually a lot of sacrifice and um, unselfies, I guess. And, but if you are married, you know that if you will embrace this, if you will embrace this pattern that Christ gave us of selfless sacrifice in marriage, that you will actually get a far richer, deeper, more meaningful, more mysterious, more beautiful uh, marriage than the uh, superficial experiences of our self-focused imagination, right? Amen. And so Rick Warren said it this way, it's not about me. It's not about you. His, he opened up his 22 million seller book. His first line, it's not about you, right? And that's the way he summarized what Jesus was saying. And marriage is not about what we can get. It's about what we can give. And then after we give, we get something much deeper, much richer, more beautiful, more lasting. And this is the pattern that Jesus gave us because marriage is simply, literally, literally, God gave us marriage as an illustration of our relationship to him. And he described it this way. Jesus said, whoever would lose his life for my sake will find it. But whoever finds his life will lose it. And some of you husbands know all about that. I, I'm just saying probably somebody knows about that. But if you have focus on getting, you will lose it. But if you focus on giving, you will gain. This is the pattern Jesus gave us. It is the pattern he lived. And so if marriage is not about taking but giving, you may ask, how can I pour myself out for this person over a lifetime? I only have so much to give. And I say, wrong. If, if, if you are pulling on the rope, right, with your mate, right, on the other, some kind of tug of war, 50-50 marriage, whatever, and you're pulling on this rope, and uh, you say, yes, you're pulling alone. And if you win, you still lose, okay? That is a lose-lose situation. But if you are pouring out for the other person as a Christian, if you are giving yourself in sacrificial love, now, now you are connected to an infinite source, okay? It is God who is pouring himself into you and to your mate through you, and that well is infinitely deep. You cannot drain it. You cannot drain it. And so it's not just now Adam and Heather or you and your spouse. It is the Spirit of God in you to bless and serve each other in his name, by his power, and for his glory as you bring his kingdom in your marriage, okay? And we remain, remember last week, we remain witnesses not only in the uttermost part in Zambia, but in Jerusalem, in Florence, yea, even at your own address, you remain his witnesses of his power, with his spirit, of his gospel, to his glory, and our individual lives are about him and for him and to him, and so are our marriages. Now, where is this going? Why are you talking about all this stuff? Acts, the church. Most people in the church approach church like marriage, what you can get. It is a service organization to help me in my personal walk with God. In other words, it's about me. I feel like going today. I don't feel like going today. But the church is less like an organization. It is more like a family. Why? Because the gospel, okay, we've talked about the gospel for a long time. The gospel unites us as a family. It unites us as a family. Think of the biblical language. God is our father, which makes us brothers and sisters, okay? in the Lord, aunts, uncles, grandparents, grandchildren, in the Lord. That unites us. And families live for the good of each other through sacrificial giving to each other. Last week, the gospel is for all, therefore we scatter. This week, the gospel unites us as family, and therefore we gather. How does that work? Quickly. Four ways the text tells us that we see the family life. This text is like a little snapshot of church family life. Now, this snapshot is really good. It's a good church, uh, snapshot, but we understand that it's not ideal. 
and we shouldn't necessarily try to pretend we were or wish we were the first century church, because if you did, just read Corinthians, and that'll blow all your bubbles, all right? But in general, they had a good thing going, and it started with this model. So here you go. They devoted these th- themselves to these things, and I'm going to take these four things and then kind of conclude with a summary of how we can do that here and what the fruit is for us. So these four things, the first thing is the apostles' teaching, in other words, the Word of God, God's voice. That's what the Bible is. It is God's voice. When you write a letter to someone and send it, uh, that person's reading the letter. That letter is not disconnected from you. I mean, it's remote from you, but it is a physical representation of your voice. If you were there, you would be saying those things, but since you're not, you write them down and send them. It is a physical representation of your voice, and your voice is a representation of your heart. And so when we hold the Word of God, we hold in our hands the physical representation of the heart of God. That's what this is. It is the vox dei, the voice of God. And so when I read it, I don't just think, oh, here's what some you know, nomadic Hebrew said. No, this is what God of the ages has said and is saying, and it is alive and still teaching us today. When Moses was transferring leadership to Joshua, remember this? They had come out of Egypt. They're heading into the promised land. Joshua's going to take over. And Moses is thinking, what's, what's the most important thing? What's going to keep this guy on track? This is what he said. These words, this revelation from God given at Sinai, these words are not just idle words. They are your life. They're your life. They're that important. But it wasn't just Moses who believed this. The psalmist also says, My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word, Psalm 119. But it wasn't just the psalmist who believed this. Jesus believed this. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And by the way, so Jesus is equating equating himself with a life-giving force. He's equating himself with the word of God. So we have the written word, the logos, and the living word, the Christos. And so Jesus is the life of God incarnate through Jesus his word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. So, I remember when I was uh, a student, when I first went off to, uh, to college, I was 18 years old. I was there at Vanderbilt in Nashville, and across the street from us was this really gorgeous old traditional church. I don't um, remember what the denomin- I thought, man, it'd be so awesome if that was a great church. It's beautiful. It's it's convenient. It's across the street. I can see it from my dorm window. So I walked over there that first Sunday, and, uh, and I participated in the service. And I walked out of there. I walked out of there fully convinced that the sun will warm you. Because that's what the sermon was about. I wasn't sure if it was a Christian service. I checked on the way out. It had a cross and everything. But I was just like, man, that's what they got. You know, I was like, man, give me the ecology club. They do that better, you know. And I can sleep in on Sundays. People, if you don't have regular, deep, gut-level Bible teaching, you are not a Christian church. I don't care what else you, what, you can call yourself all you want, you know, but you can sit in the garage all night long. That does not make you a car. All right. So at some point, you got to start off and drive somebody somewhere. And that's what our church is about because we are founded on the Word of God. There's a, I I love this, and I think people in our day, we have lost our awe at the Word of God, and I just want us to remember the words of Habakkuk who said it this way, the Lord is in His holy temple, let all the earth be silent before Him. Habakkuk got it. That the revelation of God brings silence, and then, as Daniel said, worship. It elicits the response. The Didache is a document, a Christian document from the late first century AD. Like the guy who wrote this knew the apostles. It's only about 2,300 words long, it's, uh, it's 16 sections, and it 
what, and it, it is kind of our early snapshot after the book of Acts. So Acts was the first 30 years after Jesus, from 30 to 60. That's Acts. This, the Didache, is like 60 to 90. And so we see the second generation church in the Didache. And uh, it is largely concerned with the proper teaching of the Word of God. Why? Because when that is lost, all is lost. When the teaching of the Word of God is lost, the faith is lost. So, that's what they devoted themselves to. At Sandhurst, we believe the Bible is God's Word. It is true. It is authentically His Word. It is divine, meaning He spoke it. And we stand on this whole book as good. And as a church family, one of the most important things that we do as a church family is that the, el- and the elders have insisted on this and hold my feet to the fire that it is not my idea or any other teacher's idea that's up here. At Sanders, one of the primary features of our church life and gatherings is that there will be careful, passionate, prayer-saturated, Bible-focused, Christ-exalting teaching here on Sundays. And throughout the week, Lord willing, in our other agreements. And we all agree that by any measure, that a core feature of our gathered worship service should be the Word of God. The apostles were committed to it. The first generation church was committed to it. The second generation church is committed to it. And we are committed to it. Teaching. Secondly, God's, well, firstly, God's voice. Secondly, miraculous oneness. That's what fellowship is. We have in the modern South kind of, I think, lowered the bar on fellowship, and we've kind of equated fellowship with an event. It's something you do, and there, it is something you do, but it is not first something you do. It, that's two steps down the road. Back up two steps. Fellowship first is something that you have. It is something you have with God, first of all. We have fellowship with God, koinonia, and out of the oneness that we have with God, God has made us family with each other because he has adopted us into his family. And that's why we have fellowship is that God has given us fellowship with himself and that we have all entered that family. And so we enjoy that fellowship. And so then out of the fellowship that we share with each other, we kind of, that takes many forms out there in the world, whether it's uh, visiting, talking, eating, fishing, swimming, uh, studying. I mean, there's a thousand ways our fellowship is played out as a body, all the ways that life is played out. And we see this kind of two-step fellowship with God and each other all through the Scripture. I just want to show you a couple. God is faithful, who has called you. God has pursued us. Remember, we are born into the world seeking for someone who is already looking for us, that he has called us into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And that then leads to that's, this is the very next verse that Paul appeals to us that we might live together and that there may be no divisions but united in mind and conviction. In other words, may our fellowship with God, our unity with God lead to unity with each other. We see it also in 1 John. We proclaim to you that we have... Uh, you, may you have fellowship with us. He kind of does it in reverse order. Because our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And so out of our fellowship with him, out of our koinonia, out of our oneness with God, we then share that with each other. So God is saying, what I have with you, do that with each other. And that's what I pray when I pray with my kids at night. I pray these kind of gospel prayers. You know, you might hear about the gospel this and gospel that. What it just means is applying the lessons of the gospel to daily life. So we, got, we said that last week, gospel is that God saves sinners, right? God saves sinners by grace. So, Lord, I have, as, thank you for your salvation. Thank you. And I, as I'm praying over my kids, you know, I'll take uh, Paul or John or Anna, say, God, thank you that we have received your grace. Thank you that we have been forgiven and that you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead and that you've ascended to the right hand and that you will come again to judge the living and the dead and may we be ready for that moment and may we until that day may we do the same thing for others as you have done for us may we show that same grace to others may we show that same love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control may these fruits of the spirit that you have given to us, may we share that buffet with other people around us, that they may also be drawn to be in your family, and that the family of God may be blessed when they're around us, and the non-family of God may be long to be among us. That's what it means to live the gospel, to pray the gospel, to have fellowship. 
We, we call it the men's fellowship supper or maybe a women's fellowship event. And that's all that means is that we're just living out our day-to-day life with each other. We're, we're, we are taking a, a moment to be on purpose, purposeful about living out the unity that we have in God. Uh, let's see. Well, it's two days ago now. So it was on Friday. Uh, I've got a Bob group. We have eight guys in our group. We kind of split into fours for the summer just to kind of simplify things. And so I met with my guys on Friday we were at 2 o'clock. We uh, met up at Krispy Kreme for coffee and the protein donuts. <laughs> you know, the, the ones that have cream cheese? Yeah, yeah. So since I had, I had to get like four of them. And, um, and I'm, I'm bulking up, can you tell? Yeah. And, uh, and so we talked, and we got around the table, and we, we laughed, and we celebrated, and we talked about, the, and we had we, prayer time, and the, the requests that we've shared, and the, you know, we, we have a bond there, because we, we have fellowship, we have taken it kind of to, the, to another level of depth that we don't get to do in the bigger environments, because we have just the three or four of us there, and we can really go deep and dig into each other's lives, and what's been beautiful is how um, the, the four of us have been able to kind of get up under each other's burdens and help share those burdens. And we've seen some dark times, we've seen some light times, some peaks, some valleys, but we've, we're, we're traveling this thing together and we have each other. We truly have a band of brothers to, to walk this journey with and how, how wonderful that has been. But that's what they call, the Bible calls fellowship. We have fellowship here on Sunday mornings. We get together, we gather, and we have fellowship a little bit deeper in the, in the life groups, maybe a little bit deeper in the Bob groups and the D groups, all of which are kind of kicking off here this fall. But this is all a part. All that happens here is just a visual demonstration of what we have in the Spirit, in God, and first, with God. Thirdly, breaking of bread. They committed themselves to the breaking of bread, which is worship. There's t- there's, it may sound kind of confusing in the text. Breaking of bread has two meanings in, in the New Testament. One is just good old-fashioned eating, and I'll show you that. And it's also, secondly, communion, or breaking the body and sharing the blood of Christ. So, for example, in verse, uh, and by the way, Daniel said it, worship is our natural response to the revelation of God. That is what worship is, our natural response to the revelation of God. Um. In verse 46, right here in this passage, they broke bread in their homes. They ate together. But in Matthew 14, in Matthew 14 19, we see another breaking of bread. Jesus directed them to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish. Looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves, gave them to the disciples. Obviously, it was just a big buffet dinner. That's what he was doing. He was feeding the people. But in almost exact same language, uh, in Luke, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus ties communion very closely to just the simple act of eating. And then in chapter 24 of of Luke, when he was at the table with them, remember the road to Emmaus? How did they recognize Jesus? While eating. When he was at the table with them, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Was it communion? Was it a meal? We don't know. But it was worship, whatever it was giving thanks to God, a natural response to God of giving him the glory. In Acts 20, Paul sa- or the, the writer Luke says, On the first day of the week we came together to break bread, and Paul spoke to the people. So we gather in his name, and we break bread together. In this room, we break bread in communion to worship, to recognize the symbol of faith that Christ gave us of his body and his blood. Next Sunday, will be the first Sunday of the month. We always do that on the first Sunday of the month here at Sanders. So if, if you would, just be in prayer this week. If you have something against someone, go to that person this week. Ask their forgiveness. If, if you need to work something out, either uh, get it worked out so that we can come back here next Sunday and celebrate communion together. Celebrate the body and the blood of Jesus. Fourthly, prayer. Simply conversation with God on communion and kingdom. So there's two kinds of prayer, basically. Y'all remember we talked about this back early on in Acts, how prayer is for two things, communion and kingdom. All that is is saying is that we have a relationship with God that we stoke in prayer, and then we have stuff we get done, as it were. We have requests to make in prayer. Communion or connection and action. You see that in the Lord's Prayer. So it begins with communion. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glorious is your name. Wonderful is your name. Just loving on God. 
the very next phrase, let your kingdom come. Do something now. And so you see those two sides in, in, in the Lord's Prayer. You see the communion side, Psalm 8. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 84, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Beautiful, wonderful, just connection and communion. But there's also a kingdom side to it. Psalm 18, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And then the old Petra song, I will call upon the Lord. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Who is worthy to be praised? What's he going to do? So shall I be saved from my enemies. That's right. So y'all are old too. Yeah, I get it. Right. So, yes, so shall I be saved from my enemies. And that's what God does for us and he bring, as he brings his kingdom. Psalm 20, the classic kingdom psalm, begins with, May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. And then it ends with, Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. I love that Psalm 20. He just says, Answer us when we call. Yes, we've all felt that. And so these are the two sides of prayer, communion and kingdom. And so they devoted themselves in the early church to the word, God's voice, to fellowship, miraculous oneness, worship, our natural response to the revelation of God, and prayer, conversing with God over communion and kingdom. That's the, that's the early church literally in one sentence. The early church in one sentence. So because of the unstoppable gospel, we scatter as witnesses, we gather as family, and we do these things. Now this had several results for them, and I'm going to quickly run through these, and it will for us too. Uh, first of all, is one result is unity, that the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, very quickly, I want to say that this is not communism. Okay. Communism is when the government comes and takes all your stuff from the top down and redistributes it politically. That's not what they were doing at all. It's not communalism, where there is no private property. Just everybody has everything in common. That's communalism. Okay? It is simply the fruit of their fellowship with God coming out in this word, generosity. That's what they had. Because they had private lands they would sell and, and give the money to each other. So they had private property, uh, and it wasn't forced. It was voluntary, but they would share among each other. We have a giving board out here. Let's use it. Try to commit to use the giving board at least once a year. Put out there something that you uh, either have to give or something that you need. And let's make a habit as a body of having a, a place that we gather and share, okay? That board is a place for us to share. And if you've never used it, get a card on your way out and bring it back next week, and let's kick it up and use it. And so, generosity in verse 45, selling their possessions they gave to anyone as he had need. Joy, every day they met in the temple courts, they broke, homes with glad, uh, they broke bread in their homes with glad hearts. One result of generosity, they, 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 the world is packaged just as a cliche, the joy of giving. They had joy. Life wasn't complicated. It was simple. Like Brian told us at 9 o'clock, if I've got some money, I'll give it to you. If I don't, I won't. That's pretty simple. Okay? Amen. So they had joy in that. There's a freedom in that. Amen? Wholeness. They had wholeness. I love verse 46. Every day they continued, they broke bread and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. That word sincere is really interesting. Your translation may read with glad and generous hearts or glad and simple hearts. The Greek is um, aphelotes, and it means smooth. It means literally smooth without roughness. It has the, the, the Greek particle a ah, and then phaletes. So a ah, phaletes, without roughness. So they met with joyful and without roughness in their hearts. Uh, the other ways that this is used in classical literature, this word, is to like literally stub your toe on a, on a rough rock. And so I kind of think about it as they had unstubbed hearts. You know, they were, they, were, they were just kind of at peace with themselves and whole. They were just whole. And they were enjoying this wholeness that came from the freedom of being generous. They had favor praising God and enjoying the favor of the people because uh, this was unique. It was unprecedented to be generous just for the sake of being generous. Unprecedented in the world. And then faith. People were coming to the Lord and they were saying, I want to be on the inside of this. Now, 
Some people see these, all this stuff. Man, Adam, the word, the worship, prayer, fellowship, sacrifice. You know, life is hard enough without piling all of these duties, if you will, on. And I just want to say that if you, if you understand it that way, it's totally backwards. Because these duties don't draw from us and empty us. It's like we said in the beginning. They fill and feed and energize us because if it is just you doing it for everybody, yeah, that's just going to kill you. That's going to just wipe you out. But if you say, Lord, I am an empty vessel. Please do this through me. Because this is what the world says. And this is a key point. If you've, if you've kind of been tuning out, tune in right here and just get this one sentence, then you can go, okay? This is important. The world says it this way. I do these things, and therefore, I am loved and accepted. The gospel is the opposite. Because I am loved and accepted, I will do these things. The world says, I will do these things, and then I will be loved and accepted. And the gospel says, I am loved and accepted, therefore, I will do these things. It is completely categorically different in its motivation. The actions may look the same. You may, both the world and the church may give wheelchairs to the poor. Both the world and the church may give gift bags to the homeless. Both the world and the church may offer counseling. Both the world and the church may love their neighbor, so to speak. But one is earning the favor of God and one already has it and does it freely. Out of joy, out of gratitude, and not out of fear. And so these things that we do are not the substance of our faith. They are the fruit of our faith. And when we gather and do these things from verse 42, when we talk and pray and worship and commune and, and sing and do all these things, we are doing them out of an overflow of what God is already doing in us. Okay? We walk with God because he is walking with us, and we walk with each other because we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. And we commit to each other to help, like with the wards, and like with I Hope, and like with the poor in town, and like with Brian Braddock in House of... We commit to serve with and love our brothers and sisters. Okay, so, because of the gospel, we scatter as witnesses, and we also gather as family. And here's the thing, though. Here's probably, just I'm going to raise the bar just one more notch, because I think the Bible does. We don't just walk in here because a lot of you people can be tempted to treat church like a lecture. You come once a week and you leave and you're really not a living part of the body. Imagine using your arm once a week. Try it. Don't be that arm. Walk with us day by day. Notice that in the text it said every day they were meeting together in the temple. That doesn't mean we have to have this meeting every day. But what it means is that every day it's impacting our lives that we are family and that we are looking out for each other. Coming to church involves sacrifice. You're going to need to talk to somebody and that person might have a need. Uh... We need to greet each other, listen to one another, bless one another, forgive one another, encourage one another. These things require sacrifices from us, right? They, require, they draw something out of us. And the question you might ask is, why should I do that for these random people? Why should I do that for these people around me that I don't know that well? Why should I do that for these people that are not my family when I have enough issues going on with my husband, with my wife, with my kids, with my parents, with my children? I've got enough going on with my family. Why should I show up to a life group and pray for random people when I have my own family to worry about. I just want to answer with one more question. And you might ask, what claim do these people have on my life that I owe them anything? And I want to ask you, what claim did you have on God? that he should give you himself? What claim did you have on God that he should come and adopt you into his family and give himself for you? 
What claim, what did you bring to God's table? He said, yeah, I want that one because they're going to do this for me. They're worth showing up for. Who here is worthy? We read the verses before the service. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved us when we hated him. And you know what? If we believe the gospel, then we must live in his image. And we love those other people because you know what? The people in this room are not random people to you. They are your brothers and your sisters. And we are family. And we should treat each other like family. You know, my mother is a single mother and grandmother. And she's not here. She lives in Georgia. But Barbara Sonner's here. And I can know and love her. And my brother, he's a younger single man from, and, and he's not here. But Jared Smith is here. And Andrew Howell is here behind the camera. Happy birthday, Andrew, 19 today. Yeah. And my uh, sister, who has a blended family, is in Jacksonville, and She's not here, but a lot of you have blended families, and you know what that's like, and you're here for us to love one another, okay? And so let's treat each other as family like God treated us, that he came for us, and let us adopt that same love for the people in this room, for the family of Christ, and let's pray for one another like they are family. You know why? Because they are. And one of the reasons I can be here as a pastor, one of the reasons I can be here is that there is a group just like this in Macon, Georgia, who loves my mom. And they are her family. And they are the hands and feet of Jesus to her. And so we will do that here where God has placed us. We love God because he first loved us, and now we love each other in his name. The gospel is that God saves sinners. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And because of that good news, we scatter to the nations. Yes, we gather as family, and we love one another. And the gospel unites us because we're all children of God here. So that's the first two weeks. That's the first two weeks of putting the ax in your hand. We scatter to the nations as witnesses. We gather here as family. We got two more weeks because it's not all glory. <laughs> to live above with saints we love. Oh, that will be glory. To live below with saints we know. Now that's another story. And that story will continue next week. We'll talk more about that. What is it going to be? Come and see. And speaking of saints in glory, one of our grandfathers in the faith. Y'all remember four years ago, right here on the floor, Eddie Graff is a 95-year-old man, gave his life to Jesus and was baptized in a kiddie pool right here at 95 years old. Four years later, this morning at 4 a.m., Eddie went home to be with his Lord. And so we thank the Lord for his life, who served his country, fought in the war, and, uh, and at the end gave his life to the Lord and, uh, and showed us how to walk in humility. So let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, um, as I think about this passage, this life of the family, Lord, that we scatter to the nations in mission and we gather here week by week as family. I pray that you indeed would make us a family. I thank you for Eddie who lived so long as a citizen of America, as a soldier, as a defender, and at the end, Lord, became a brother. Lord, be with his family as they mourn his loss and yet celebrate his home come.
And I pray that in the meantime, that we would honor the gospel and truly love one another as family, as brothers and sisters that you've given us to be, and that we would come and that we would devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to prayer, and to one another as you have given yourself for us, Lord. Yes, we scatter to the nations, but we only scatter because we gather. We only have, have a mission because you have a mission and you have adopted us into your family and we simply want to bring people into that fellowship. And so, Lord, as we sing, you are joy, you are our morning sun. Lord, as we walk together, sometimes there are those who uh, rejoice and there are those who weep through the night. Lord, they, some have, are fighting in the battle, some have won, and some are still struggling. But Lord, for the, regardless of where we are on that spectrum, Lord, we fight together, we struggle together. And we know that we struggle following a Savior who has fought death and won and is alive. And Lord, your mercies will never cease. They are new every morning, and you follow us all of our days with an absolutely certain hope of peace. So Lord... Give us confidence in you, and may we share that confidence with each other on this journey that you've given us as church family here at Sanders. In Jesus' name, amen.